if you're having a successful practice um, as a teacher, as a movement teacher, as a therapist of some kind, what is the key to your success? So this is something that I've been thinking about quite a lot in my own practice. What, what is at the base of the success? And over time, for me, it becomes clearer and clearer that every once in a while I can do some magic with someone and they will have a problem in their shoulder or their knee and I will do the little moment and it will be a miracle and that's wonderful, but what consistently over time will assist someone to find a better foundation, a better place for themselves. And consistently, what I find is that the clients, the students I have, who in themselves find a deeper, more profound level of awareness in their body, have a chance to rehabilitate, have a chance to find new options, they have a new possibility because they're more present in their own self. So this, this area has been very interesting me, for me in the last 10 years, looking at, uh, as a structural integration practitioner, what is integration? How do I know there's integration here? You know? So Moshe says, if we don't know what we're doing, how can we do what we want? Yeah. So I'll ask you to do something. Cross your arms. Now, cross them the other way. Is there a fraction of hesitation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So we have a habit, right? So I know if I do my usual crossing, do your usual, that's home, right? We know that one. I know exactly how to go to the other side. How I go to the other side is I go, oh, if I grab my bicep, then I know I can do it almost the same. But what's happening here is that we have a pattern. There's a pattern, and our system is all patterns. There's very little, there's very little new, very little original. We are continually in a movement pattern, in an emotional pattern, in an intellectual thinking pattern, in a response pattern to each other. Are we becoming more mindful as individuals or as a culture? You know? In terms of our body mindfulness, and I'll, I'll talk both about mindfulness and about body mindfulness, one of the big challenges in our body, I see as the chair. And I say the chair is not the enemy. And the chair is not the enemy, really. But our, the way that we use the chair makes the chair into a problem. And because we don't come back to live on the floor. So what happens? What happens when we don't come to the floor, come to the earth. The chain, the muscle chain from the feet, from the toe hinge, through the ankle, through the knee, into the hip, into the center, starts to stiffen. And if any of you have had um, injuries in your ankle or your knee or your hip, and you know when you have to uh, avoid the movement, you have to work hard to recover it again. I know I had a, a three tears in my meniscus uh, two years ago, and for nine months I couldn't get more than just over 100 degrees of flexion, and I had to work very hard to get it back. So when we're doing something that we think is good for us, like we're practicing yoga, how many of you find someone coming to you, they're doing yoga or they're doing tai chi or they're doing something, they're going to the gym, and you discover that they're doing something that's working against them, the way they use their body, the way they practice. So 
it's not just having the good intention to do the right thing. It's having the understanding of the structural awareness, of the coordinated structural awareness where there's a balance in the system. So it's always us. You come to Spain, it's still you. <laughs> I go home, it's still me. How present are we in our own body? And as um, movement teachers, as practitioners who are trying to assist others in their own embodiment, this is really a provoking question for us. Am I, am I coming to the party myself? Am I you know, working with my own embodied awareness? So uh, many years ago, a client said to me that uh, after he'd had his session, he felt like an absentee landlord coming back to his house. You know? So we can get very far from our body. A lot of talk these days about mindfulness. Um, particularly John Kabat-Zinn has put a lot of attention into the in area of stress reduction and mindfulness as you know, prolifer pro proliferated through cognitive therapy and many other areas and really being used all through psychotherapy and all through physical therapies these days. But what is it? The Buddha spoke of, of mindfulness and said that mindfulness itself was the sole path to liberation. Okay? But mindfulness is not just awareness. You could be aware and do something cruel. You could be aware and torture someone. That's possible. That's not mindfulness. Mindfulness is this profound awareness in the present moment, you know, with an open-heartedness, with an acceptance, with a curiosity, with an interest, an open interest. It's a special kind of listening to be really mindful. If you've ever been sitting with someone you loved who is dying, or very ill, and you are concerned about them. You know how you could really remember what's happening? You, you really hear them. You're really listening to them. It's a very special mindfulness that happens in that state where you're, you're vulnerable, you're open, you're interested, you're concerned, you're worried maybe. So you're very alert, you're very awake, very present. In the Buddhist sutras, there are four foundations for mindfulness. The first one, the Buddha called body mindfulness. And this is the awareness of our body in space, of sensations, of movement. And so this one would be activated um, in a lot of Buddhist meditation. How many of you have done some Buddhist meditation, like Vipassana or something like that? A few. So if you do some meditation like that, often they'll use the walking meditation. It's very slow motion walking to bring this meditation in the body, which is the first foundation there. I'd call that the, the level of the moving body. The second one is quite interesting, this mindfulness of feeling. And if any of you have uh, read the, I think it was called The Second Brain, Gershon's book on the visceral brain, very, very interesting. Um, it's about, this feeling sense is about the attraction and aversion and neutrality. So we always have a feeling of one of those three. And that precedes our cognitive awareness. Our body, you know how it is. Someone's there and you feel open towards them. And your body opens and you feel open and you feel attracted. You feel warm and easy. And then someone else is there and you feel yourself withdrawing. That precedes your cognitive evaluation. That's the body. It's the animal you that's doing this. So this is the feeling level. The mindfulness of the knowing faculty is more the level of our emotions like fear or anger. You know, our a level of uh, emotional kind of response. The feeling one and the second one is not really the emotions. It's this energetic response. And it, there's a, 
there's an example in uh, Malcolm Gladwell's book Blink, in which some students taking a test were turning over cards, and they were trying to find out something. And so when they put the sensors on them, they realized that wh well before they figured it out cognitively, their body already had decided what it was. They knew the one, the body knew which was going to be the, the one of choice. So our body is choosing, and many of us talk about this intuitive, you know, intuitive uh, power being something body oriented. So that very much fits into this area. The last one the Buddha spoke about is the mindfulness of the truth or the Dharma. And this is the awareness of a, of a path, of a path to liberation. The, the Buddha's whole story was not to create Buddhism. He never would have been a Buddhist. Buddha would have said, my God, let me out of here, you know? Um, his path was a very open path of exploration. He said, find out. Suzuki says, our mind should be soft and open enough to see things as they are without effort and to understand, understand things as they are. Wisdom is not something to learn. Wisdom will come out of mindfulness. It's very hard for us to trust this. Very hard. We are grasping for knowledge all the time, and sometimes our greatest insights come in the gap. When we are stop grasping, we've worked hard, oh, come in this moment of mindfulness. Now, um, Tarchin Hearn is a, a friend of mine in New Zealand. He's a, uh, well, he's, I guess he's one of these, uh, of the tribe of ex-Buddhist monks who have still teach a kind of secular Buddhism. And he's a fabulous man who very much teaches a body-oriented kind of approach to Buddhist understanding. He says, uh, a practice for awakening is, first of all, a friendly inquiry into what is arising with curiosity and engagement, and then a calm, relaxed awareness, observing with interest and presence. Well, when something really terrible is happening, it's pretty hard to arrange that. It takes enormous, enormous um, inner strength to maintain this level of open curiosity when things aren't going wonderful. You know, this is the challenge. It's all very well when things are going great. But when it's not going so well, can I bring this? And often we speak about meditation as being, as if meditation was counting your breathing or saying special words, you know, or walking slowly. And this is just something. It's really just something. It's not really meditation. You know, and Tarchin says here, following the breath or labeling perceptions is not a path to liberation unless it is flavored with the essence of friendly inquiry. It may only be a path of being a major controller. You know, I have a lot of friends involved in Buddhism get very tight, you know, and, and it's... Uh, a level of awareness that is not very open, actually. It gets quite tight and rigid. It's not because of Buddhism. You know, it's just an aspect of human nature. Here it says, Mais les yeux sont aveugles et il faut chercher avec le cœur. It's necessary to see with your heart. That's what the little prince says. You know, not only looking with our eyes, not only grasping with our hands to see things, but to feel with our feeling body as well, so that we're not just seeing in that way. Stand up, please. And you just, I think you have enough room in your aisle. If you <coughs> stand behind your chair, we'll do a very short walking meditation, okay? So you can walk any, anywhere from where you are. And so what I'd like you do is you'll face one direction because you're going to have to go either left or right to get out of your little aisle. So we're not we're not trying to keep you in your little spot there, okay? So shift all of your weight onto one leg. And then just put the heel down. Some of us were exploring this a little this morning. And just put the heel down, but no weight in the heel, okay? 
the weight of the heel is on the floor. And then let the whole foot come onto the floor. You're still containing it. The weight of the foot is on the floor now. And now slowly shift the weight of the body and the aligned body onto the other foot. And let the back leg and the back foot be very soft. Soften the back knee and bring a little movement to the pelvis. Let the pelvis move a little bit forward and back. Takes your attention into your breath. Just allow your breath to be easy and natural. Now all your weight is on the forward leg. And the back hip is free. And let the back leg come forward and the heel touches without weight. And then the weight of the foot only. And slowly, very slowly with the back knee soft and coming off of the toe hinge at the back, shifting the weight forward. Feel the whole body, feel the breathing, feel the earth. Notice the space around you. Take another very slow step, the heel touches. The whole foot is in contact, the weight is transferring. The breath is easing. And continue to walk slowly. Find a way through this little maze you're in right now. Being aware of the breath, being aware of the space around you, being aware of the ground. Being aware of something greater like a little smile in your heart that we're here. We have this privilege to be here, exploring our body, our consciousness. When you're on a retreat, often you're walking only about four or six meters back and forth in the same place to convince you that you're never going to be getting anywhere. Already here, we start to think, oh, I might be going that way. I might be going near this person. I might, all the little parameters start to come in. Shall I go more quickly or more slowly? So let your awareness as you're walking slowly be more on the outside of your skin. Feel the air from the air conditioning, the skin. Sense the people around you. What happens in your thinking process or your emotions in this slow walking? Okay, thank you very much. It was very beautiful to watch, particularly this traffic jam over here. So in, in classical Buddhism, which I can't really say that much about, although I will continue to. <laughs> and I'm not really a Buddhist, but I have, um, I have spent quite a bit of time with some Buddhist guys who've been there for a long time, and lamas, etc. Um, sitting meditation, where you're very still, is also the very strong part. These two, the sitting and the walking meditation. We'll come back to the sitting one. This is, this is Bangladesh. This is a worker, right? And um, so you keep thinking he's gonna stop, right? No. So that must be it. Oh, did you watch him move his foot there? As the brick was coming down? So that must be enough, right? Oh no, let's take some more. And, but this is not a circus, right? This is somebody at work.
so, this is mindfulness in the body at work. <laughs> Just like all of us would be doing, right? <laughs> so, sometime, sometime when I'm teaching uh, structural integration or myofascial techniques, and I'm asking someone to use their hand, or let's say use their elbow in a certain way, and I had some experiences when I was teaching a group of very senior massage people, written books and all the rest of it. And so I'm asking them to lean in to feel with their elbow. So that's already quite different if you're going to feel with the back of your forearm or your elbow. And then I'm saying, OK, now you're doing that. I want you to soften the back knee. I want you to maintain the pressure where you're working and lift the shoulder slightly, sink the elbow slightly, drop the shoulder blade slightly, lengthen the neck, adjust and lengthen the space between your rib cage and your pelvis. If we can't do that as practitioners, how could we possibly expect our client in movement or on the table to access this kind of mindfulness where they're continuing to expand in their system as they're using their system? So for me, in the, in the practice of structural integration, in the practice of my coaching and the other work, I see that my job is to find a place in my own self where I can cultivate this awareness. And there's a kind of, I think there's a kind of induction. So in most traditions uh, where there's a master involved, you know, like a, in the martial arts, in, um, even in painting, in many other areas, we often talk about this direct transmission, that somehow you get something special. You know, people in, in terms of the Rolfing world, they say, yeah, I got something special from Ida Rolf, or I got something special from my teacher. And I think that is really true. I know from my contact with my um, Taoist master and my, and my Tai Chi masters, that there's something in the relationship, something energetic that I received there that was very profound for me, that made a big difference, that was a kind of a food in the same way that when I'm home and the mountain is behind me and I can sit down and, and the mountain feeds me and I go, ah, I'm home, I'm home. And the mountain gives me this food. So I think there is something in this lineage, and we are part of this lineage in many ways, that as a practitioner, we bring something quite special. And the more conscious we become in our work, then what happens is there's an opportunity for what we bring and our space to touch the other person. And we are in an interbeing. We're in an interconnectedness. It's a resonance. This is We've very much transcended technique. We've gone way beyond a technique of releasing something. We've gone way beyond a technique of achieving something. We come into a resonance where our cells are resonating and something new and potential can happen. It's very, very strong. It's a very, uh, for me, it's a very high level of potential of integration. It's not to get the coordination right between hip flexion and spinal flexion or get that awareness. That's, that's all good stuff. And it's very important if you're doing rehab. Very important. Sometimes you could be at a peak level, top level of understanding and experience in your body. And then you lose it. And you're starting all over. Any of you had that experience where you've been really starting over in rehab? It's very hard work. Eh? And Sometimes you just want to give up. And with our, with our students and with our clients, we would find that. So we're some kind of an animal, right? Sometimes um, it's not actually very nice to the animals to describe us as an animal. Because the way we operate on the planet, um, no other animals creating the genocide we create. No other animals polluting the planet the way we do. So maybe it's not very nice. but. There's a part of us that's very animal-like. Right? And so we're exploring this. And um, it's very interesting. When, um, when I met uh, Robert 
25 or 27 or something years ago. And we think of how we thought about the body, how we thought things worked, how we thought release happened. And every 10 years, we have a new idea. You know, and it's, uh, it's, it's actually fascinating, but at a certain point you have to go, oh, okay, well, actually we don't know very much. <laughs> we're, we're really um, learning a lot. I hope we're learning a lot. So, we have many bodies, the skeletal body, the muscles, the fascia, the nerves, but out of our 100 trillion cells, only 10% have human DNA, right? So I was at, um, at the university in Auckland one time for anatomy class, and there was a picture of someone with only their muscles, and there was a picture of a skeleton, and then there was a picture, and it was all the microbes on the body with all of the body taken away. And it was a whole body, just like the, the ones we've seen with the fascia. So we think, you know, we're somebody, but we're only 10% of a, a microbe system that's walking around. So uh, how, do, how confident can, can we be about who we are? Hmm? <laughs> My microbes talking to your microbes. So we have a lot of models of how the system, how the body works. So many see us as energy beings with chakras, or in, uh, in Taoism, as I was saying, the three Dantians. But it's important for us to realize that none of us are the same. So a friend was telling me during an osteopathic test where they were doing a palpation test, they, that uh, they had to palpate someone and they were evaluated on what they were palpating. Now, it turned out they were getting very confused. They had found someone whose liver was on the opposite side to bring in for the palpation to test the poor student. Now, that's a very, that's a very sensible thing, really, because we think that we have seven cervical vertebrae. We think we have 12 thoracic vertebrae. We think we all have a psoas minor, or whatever it is we think we have. But it's just an idea. And none of us, not one of us, is the same as anyone else. So for us, our mindfulness needs to become very unique. And our awareness of another person needs to become very unique because we cannot think, because I looked in the anatomy book, because I did this study, that that person is like this. It's just not like that. So just, just stand up. Now, what I'd like you to do, stand, Tuan is so imagine imagine something not super tragic right but something that makes you feel sad okay something that makes you feel a little sad that makes you that brings you down a little and you you allow that to be in your body you feel a little down a little sad but something that you can feel maybe think of something in your life that that touches you something that affects you in your life that you're not happy with, okay? And I'd like you to just hold that for a moment. And now imagine that in that, being in that place, that you had the opportunity to get a great job that you really wanted. But how you feel is just like this. You feel this downward pressure kind of sadness. So now you're going for your interview, so you, you leave that there, and you're going to, on top of it, stand up. And you're getting ready for your interview, but you still have this awareness of the inner sadness. Okay? Now, beside you to the person, turn to the person beside you and shake their hand with this mixture of the inner and the outer. And just meet the person beside you. What is it like to meet another person when you have this inner conflict? That's actually not very different from things that happen a lot to us, is it? Right? We often have to transcend something. We have to overcome something to do something else. If you're a parent, hey, if you're a parent, maybe you're feeling terrible. You don't think you can do anything, but you have to serve your child. You have to stay up all night. You have to do whatever it is you do. Then 
you learn something special. This is a very, very special lesson we learn as a parent. You know that we learn how to be a warrior. You learn how to transcend our own um, weakness, to find another strength, to go a bit further because the child needs it. And because we love the child, we can do that. So it's a very important lesson for us in a much bigger place than in the family. In terms of our mindfulness, trauma in the body is a major factor. Okay? We could have trauma from something very strong, you know, like being bitten by a crocodile or uh, hit by lightning. But quite often, the traumas that we have might be smaller than that, much smaller, like a small little crash in the parking lot where an unexpected car hits you from the side. And our system responds and reacts to it. When this happens in nature, have any of you read uh, Peter Levine's book, Waking the Tiger, or done any work with Peter? Yeah. So he talks about the, the animals in nature discharging. And so the the, uh, let's say the cheetah is chasing the antelope on, from one side of, the, um, of the, the drinking pond to the other and chases and chases and the antelope gets away. Well, when the antelope is stopping because it's suddenly free, the antelope's discharging, shaking. And this is this is something that we need. It's something that we offer in a way in our bodywork sessions. Sometimes we're working with someone and we don't uh, really understand it. But our presence and our touch allows a discharge, very important discharge. Most movement systems, most dancing allows us to discharge. So this, this trauma in the body, it's very important that we're aware of whether or not trauma is embedded physiologically because you, you don't counsel that out. It's not talk therapy doesn't do it. It's actually some kind of sensory motor sequencing to release this. Pat Ogden does some fabulous work with this. In terms of our day-to-day -day experience, something very key is our posture, and our posture is really just a way that we've been moving a lot. However, however we keep moving will be what our posture is, right? So in terms of waking up in the body, the first part is being aware of this tendency to collapse, aware of a tendency to collapse, and then becoming aware of a possibility of an upward movement of a kind of spring force like the children have. So in uh, traditional Chinese medicine, they say that in the first 20 to 25 years, you have this spring force in you. You have this upward energy, beautiful energy that you see in the children. It's all up like this, right? And, but as we get older, we don't have that same energy. So within the system, is the Tai Chi and the Qi Kung for cultivating this energy to build on at the time when the, the energy starts to slow down, when it starts to come down. So we still maintain that energy, right? So in, what I, how, in my picture of structural integration, one of the things we're doing is we're working like that. We're cultivating this spring force, this upward energy in our work to bring that through the body. In, in movement and in posture. So this is a very difficult area. Once you know, yeah, I tend to slump this way. Oh, but I can come up to here. But we can't actually hold ourselves up. It, it doesn't work. Not by an idea, right? So the, the place of getting from this consciousness of the collapse to a place where there's a natural lift, where you're just there, you're just in that natural place. That's a big place for work. And if you ever find the place where, ah, oh, yeah, 
I'm right here. I'm in the place where, where I have the open structure. I have the balance of the soft tissue. Then it's a beautiful thing. Each of our habits, each of our postures contributes to the place where we stand. What's important about becoming aware of the collapse or the different kinds of collapse is because that's, that's the place of working. That's our place. The limiting patterns is the place of potential. So as a teacher, as a practitioner, if I don't become aware of my own limiting patterns in movement, in my own limiting patterns in consciousness, and I'm trying to help someone else, it'd be hard for me. I need to discover something about that. Discover what are the holding patterns in my own body. We are hardwired for certain things, right? We don't need training. We, we maybe could use some training in how to have some wonderful sex, but we're actually hardwired to be attracted and to enjoy uh, a rich sexual life. Women are hardwired to be able to birth their own child. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't sometimes problems where you need someone special, but there are many things that are into the system, designed in the system. And as I was saying before, we are, we are designed to be able to get down to the floor. We're designed to be able to sit on the floor, to be able to squat on the floor. And all you have to do is to go to countries where everyone isn't sitting on chairs. So all of these spring-loaded joints are continually being lubricated. When we stop doing it, it's difficult. When, when I blew out my knee, I knew that if I stopped sitting on the floor, I might not be sitting on the floor again. So for a while, I really tried to avoid sitting on chairs entirely. When I talk on the phone, I'd lean against the wall and do anything to, to not sit on a chair because I knew I had to put a lot of time over a year and a half to get my access back to the ground. We're designed to do many things, to reach, to carry, to run fast even designed to hang. Mm -hmm. We're designed to run long distances. If any of you read that book, Born to Run, I was really surprised to see that, that humans could outrun horses. That was amazing because they could sweat and the horses couldn't sweat at the same level. You know, it's very, very interesting. So what is body mindfulness? So I see it in two ways. One is a state right now, just as we were, we were walking slowly. So this is a state available to us at any point. We can take a step. We can be aware of the space around us. We can sit still and quietly and cultivate this state of awareness of the present moment, of being very open to this present moment. Okay? Every one of us can do that at our level at any moment. And the second one is a level of body awareness in which we really practice, which we train. So in structural integration, we go through a lot of basic training, just about sitting down, how about standing up, how about taking a step, very basic stuff. And another level would be beyond that into peak performance. So Acrobats, professional athletes, they understand about that level of training. So uh, one of my clients in New Zealand, he's been coming, he's probably been coming for about 25 years since he was just around 20. And um, it's quite interesting when we have a, a session together because if you were filming it from the sky and you look down, you couldn't probably most of the time figure out who was the therapist and who was the client. You just see these guys doing something. And um, because every time he comes, he's coming with his projects. And we're brainstorming together and working out 
how can he be helped in his way? And he, he's a forest ecologist, so he goes out for days counting kiwis and counting little insects and things like that. And he brings his little tools with him and tries to take care of himself. And I uh, asked him about mindfulness in the body after his years of practicing in, in uh, sessions with me. And, he, and this is what he wrote for me. He said, to understand whether you check it every day. Anything else is emotional subjectivity. Therefore, you must do things with and explore your body energy every day. Your daily body mindful practice, whether it's stretching, rolling around on massage balls, doing yoga or tai chi, running, etc., is a mirror. It's your weather report. If I don't know how to mobilize my feet and stretch my back to reboot myself, all the treatments and massage in the world won't help me. When I'm doing well in the bush, I feel spacious. I see beauty, and I notice that I'm humming as I skip across a ravine. So, yes, he's talking about feeling better in his physical body, but immediately it transcends that into a kind of aliveness, into a kind of appreciation of something that's much bigger. So how do we develop this? So this is a, a model from... Well, I'm not sure where Ron stole it from, because Ron Kurtz uh, would gather things from everywhere. So he called this the sensitivity cycle. I call it the cycle of effective and healthy action. So from a place of relaxation, as long as we have some insight and we can go forward, we get clarity. We get clear about what we want to do. And then we act effectively. Acting effectively, we feel satisfied. Feeling satisfied, we relax. And that's one action. I wanted to go to the movies. I picked a good movie. I went. It was great. I loved it. I came home. And many of our actions are much more complex than that. Right? But what happens if I can't figure out what movie to go to? I might never get to the movies. Right? Or if I'm very clear about picking the movie, but uh, I can't quite decide and I don't get out the door and I miss the movie, right? Or I go to the movie and I get there and it's a, it's a good movie, but then I actually just switch onto something else and I don't really absorb the movie. I don't take it in. So I don't go to the satisfaction. I don't come back to a relaxation. And in more complex uh, relationships, it would be different. In our modern world, something that's happening pretty regularly is we go from the clarity to the effective action. This is kind of a business model. You're very clear, boom, you do it. You succeed, you get it. But you don't really have enough time for satisfaction because you've got to get back to the clarity to beat the next chance. And so you're going from the clarity to the effective action and back and back. And what do you miss out? You miss out the nourishment, satisfaction, sense of completion, relaxation, this whole basis that allows you to relax. So it's hard for us to maintain a, a good level of, of body mindfulness if we don't deepen in the phase of the relaxation, if we don't come right around the cycle. So this is a spiral. Um, this, this chart and a few others um, you could find in a, an article on my website or on Robert's website in an article called How Do I Listen? And this one is a path to embodied awareness, which is taking that cycle as a spiral. So we travel around it at a level that we can cope with. And as we train ourselves, we train at a higher level. So the spiral would look like this. Sometimes we just stay on this level. And then we can move a bit. If it's a rehab situation, the spiral will stay like this for a while. And then it comes up. And it's maybe slow. But if you're a very sharp learner, maybe it's going very quickly to a high level of embodied awareness. Now the other side of it is that it actually goes down too. 
So if we lose ourselves, we become very dissociated, very disconnected, we can go down the toilet, you know? And you probably all know someone who's gone down the toilet into this disconnected, dissociated state, disembodied state, you know? To experience our energy is to experience the relationship between the earth and the sky. We are all in this, as I was talking about earlier, in this space where we have the potential all around us to move and to feel our space. But quite often we're moving through a very small space. We're not taking up our space. In terms of our self and our therapy, um, I'm not sure if this, is, uh, if this is just from Uber or where this came from some years ago. This, this area of mindfulness in, in structural integration, in therapy, four important areas. One, structure, coordination, perception, and then meaning. So if we try to achieve everything through working on the structure or working on the coordination, we could be very challenged because at times the perception or the meaning is so important to the person that if we're not dealing with that as a therapist, we can become of many, aware of many roles as we become more mindful of a resonant presence, of a holistic approach, but also a skillful technician. That's very important. You want to be this skillful technician, but you don't want to lose the presence. And that's a very big challenge for us. With this level of mindfulness, we're able to see flow, different flows in our sessions, different flows in the consciousness of our client. When we're working in our treatments, if we work off the table with an active person, we have to be much more aware. But does it mean being serious and not spontaneous to, uh, to be mindful? No, of course not. It means to be awake, to be present, and to be continually curious. So yoga and Tai Chi, they're, they're really something to find from the inside. And if you're, if you're working with a different level of ability, then the level of mindfulness will be different again. A few years ago, probably about five, year, five or six years ago now, I was working with um, Mary Lohr from uh, one of the Cirque du Soleil troops. And I was writing this article on mindfulness. And so I wrote to her to ask her about mindfulness and how it had a relationship in her art as an acrobat. And you know how it is. Sometimes you want to do something like that, and you never find the person, and it's gone. Turns out I got her right away, and she wrote back, emailed me, and says, oh, it's so great that you asked me this question because that's, that's exactly where I am right now, thinking about this kind of thing in, in the new troop. And uh, she said, when I asked her about what mindfulness in the body meant to her as a performer, and you see, that's her on the right. She's holding up this guy, right? And you might think that these people would be very um, strong or rigid in some way to hold this. But in fact, they were the softest. Their tissue was so soft you couldn't find a tough part of it. So they had this art. And uh, Stu McGill talks about this in some of his work. He's talking about the peak performers, the high athletes. What they can do is they can work in an absolute sense and they can let everything go. And this is very much what Eve and Mary Lore were doing. They're not only getting this high level of action, but a total release. So when I asked her what it meant to her, this mindfulness, she said, it's probably the love of this art, of what we do, but also it is believing. I'm here. It is now. And in this moment, I can reach a state of body mindfulness. I'm not thinking about the past, about what I did last time, or what I must do. I feel. I feel the change of temperature, or simply how Eve, my partner, is. He doesn't need to talk to me. 
I feel in the moment what he needs, what we need, and I feel the mood of the audience today. I know I am free to do what I want and to take my breath when I want to. I can create because freedom is there. And since every single moment of life is different, I try to stay connected to these subtle changes and to take care about too much controlling. A mistake at times can open a new avenue and a new way of thinking to embrace. Yes, I think mindfulness is the way I keep fluidity and flexibility in my body and my mind. So in, this becomes absolutely essential in these areas of peak performance. So I'll finish with a little poem. So I have this experience. I'm, um, I love my family, my wife and my children and grandchildren, but I'm really in love with my mountain behind, that lives behind my house. And the mountain gives me this great strength. And I had the experience many years ago, probably about 25 years ago when I was riding on the hills there, that I could reach down through the horse I was on, through the horse's legs into the ground and feel the ground. And that when I was walking at times on the ground, that I could feel the very ground speaking to me. And it really gave me the, you know, the shivers, but really has bound me to this place in a way and made me aware of the skin of the earth. Well, she is listening. Just for a moment, let the great stillness hold you. The earth is listening. She feels your body pressing onto hers. The sky smiles when you whisper into his vastness. He blows inside you, fills you, breathes you. The blood coursing through your veins well knows the path back to your heart. But do you? <laughs> <laughs>